We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. Uh oh, thrift diving. Hey, what's up? It's Serena Apia from thriftdiving.com, which is a podcast, a blog, and a YouTube channel that helps you decorate, improve, and maintain your home with paint, power tools, and thrift stores without sacrificing your budget, the environment, or style. What's up? Welcome to episode 41 of the podcast. Today, I'm really excited to be talking about this topic because if you are someone who paints furniture, which if you're listening to this, you either probably already paint it or you want to paint it, I'm going to be talking about 10 furniture painting mistakes that commonly happen when you paint furniture. And we're going to talk about how to fix them and how to avoid them. <laughs> the best thing is to, to just completely avoid them. But I know that's not totally possible. But today is going to be sort of a long podcast if I don't break it up into two. So this is going to be part one. We're going to cover mistakes one through five. And then next week for episode 42, you got to come back because we'll cover mistake number six through 10. <laughs> and let me tell you about my journey with painting furniture. I started when I bought this house. Actually, I started a little bit before that, but I started when really we bought the, this house. And if you remember from episode one, we didn't have any furniture. We had come from a two bedroom condo moving to a four, be, a four, four bedroom. Yeah. Four bedroom, <laughs> single family home. We had no furniture. So, and we had no money. So going to the thrift store was the best thing for me to do to find what I needed. And then I taught myself how to paint furniture. And there's things that you learn along the way. But I remember that first piece that I'd ever painted with chalk paint. This was a, it looked like kind of like a card catalog. It was just a small little cabinet that I bought from the thrift store, of course. And it had all these little drawers. And I remember the first stroke of paint that I put on there. I was like, wow, this looks horrible. <laughs> Like, ooh, is this supposed to look like this? So if you're somebody who has never painted furniture, you probably are going to experience that when you paint your first piece. You're going to think, did I do something wrong? Like, why does it look like this? So we're going to talk about some of those things in this podcast, because you're going to run into those mistakes. And if you know how to prevent them, well, you're going to be on the better path to having this like amazing furniture that doesn't look like you just started. But even if you're somebody that has already been painting furniture, you might still have some of these problems. And we're going to talk about them today. So let's jump right into it today. All right. So mistake number one is something that happens without a doubt. I think for most people when they're just beginning to paint furniture, it's paint drips and runs. And there's nothing more that I hate than getting those paint drips and runs, especially when you don't see them. Because what happens is when you let it dry and you come back to it and you notice it, there's not a lot that you can do. Now you can possibly sand them out, but that can also cause problems depending on the kind of paint that you're using. You may not be able to sand it out. And I just want to run through what some of these causes are. So the first thing is that your paint might be too watery. Okay, and this is something that happens when you first open that can. A lot of times you'll have what looks to be like it's very watery on top, right? It's the water that's sitting there, but you have all the pigment on the bottom. So to prevent that, what you should do is thoroughly stir that paint and mix those thick pigments from the bottom. But you, what you can also do is before you even open the can, turn the can over and let it sit for maybe 20, 30 minutes and then turn it right side up and then open it up and stir it. That usually will do the trick. Now, if it's still watery, you can leave the top off for about 20 minutes or so and let the paint thicken up. All right, so the next cause of why you might be getting some paint drips and runs is that you might just have too much paint on the paintbrush. And I have taught furniture painting classes back when we were still meeting in person and when I had time to do it. And without a doubt, most people would put too much paint on the paintbrush, especially when you're new. And when you overload the paintbrush, too much paint gets slathered all over the project. It creates these runs. And to prevent overloading your brush, here's a little tip. <laughs> now, you don't necessarily want to use the edge of the can to offload some of that paint because what happens is that it gets trapped down into the rim of the can. And then when you go to try to put the 
the cap on, over time it builds up and then you can't put the cap on, you can't put the lid on the can. So what you can do is actually to put a rubber band around the can. So just imagine taking a rubber band and you put it so that the, the band is stretching right across the top of the open can. So as you're putting your paintbrush in, you can use that rubber band to offload some of the paint. So this will prevent that gunking up. I call it the gunking. <laughs> you can prevent some of the gunking up around the rim of the can and that will help. Now, I don't always do this myself. Sometimes I just, you know, I do use the edge of the can, but you have to be very careful because like I said, once you get it down in there, it's very difficult to get out. And if it keeps building up, then what will happen is, like I said, you won't be able to get the can on. And then guess what happens if you accidentally knock that can over? that top that can't fit properly, it'll spill. So just be very careful there. So another reason that you might be getting some runs and spills is you might not be holding your paintbrush properly. Again, if you are a newbie, a lot of times people will just clamp down on that paintbrush. And by the time they're done painting, whatever it is that they're painting, their hand is aching. <laughs> so what I would tell you is loosen your grip just a little bit. And then when you're painting along the edge, and this is where the runs tend to occur, hold your paintbrush on the same side as the edge and gently pull the bristles over the edge. Now, try to visualize this with me. Let's pretend you've got a box, a wooden box. You're using three quarter inch plywood. What happens when you're painting that edge, that top edge of the box, you're not going in the same long direction. You tend to do like those really short strokes right over the side of the box. And all that's doing is offloading the paint onto the edge of the box. And so when you look, you're like, oh my gosh, I got all these drips and runs. But what I find is that if you just hold your paintbrush and just run it very gently along that edge, then you can prevent that paint from being offloaded onto your box. Now, this might be a hard thing to visualize, especially if you're a newbie, but trust me on this. When you're using your paintbrush, don't just do those short little strokes over the edge because you will get a lot of paint dribbling down the side of your project. So put a little bit of paint on the brush and just try to gently stroke it. Don't do those quick, fast strokes. Just very gently try to run it along and you'll you'll notice that the color is is getting onto your wood, but you don't have all those drips and, and spills. Okay, another problem, another reason why you might be getting these runs and drips is because you're not rotating your work. This is a problem when you are painting things like chairs. For example, chairs have a ton of edges, right? You figure each leg has four sides. So you've got 16 sides that you've got to cover. And a lot of times if you don't have it on, let's say a Lazy Susan, which I typically love to put furniture on so that I can rotate it and see all sides. So if you don't do that, if you're not rotating your work, you're going to miss where those runs tend to occur. And if you've got those little edges of those legs, you're probably going to have some paint runs there. So what I say is just turn your work often or even walk around your painted furniture to look for those runs before they dry. And if you can get an old Lazy Susan, I have seen them at the thrift store. I've actually made them myself. That was really easy for me to sit projects on, even larger projects, and just rotate them so that I can spin them and I wouldn't have to run around the table. But I would say look at YouTube or do I have the link? I may even have a link. I think I have a link to a Lazy Susan that I'd built for a project. And if you do something like this, it makes it very easy for you to just sit in your chair or stand at a table and you rotate the project. You don't have to run around the table. All right. So another problem is you might be painting without enough light. This is something that happens to me all the time. Now, even though I have my beautiful shed, it's not completed yet. It's not finished on the inside. So anytime that I have done projects, it's been in my garage and I don't have a lot of natural light in there. So what happens is that, you know, you've got a little bit of light coming in. And if you don't have enough light, you can't see the drips and the runs. <laughs> so what I would tell you is to have as much light as possible, either paint outdoors during the daylight. Now outdoors, you don't have to paint outdoors because of the smell or odor or anything like that. A lot of furniture paints that are on the market today, I mean, they don't have an odor. You know, they don't, most of them, I would say, don't have VOCs 
volatile organic compounds. So they're very safe to use indoors, but I love painting outdoors when I can because you've got the best natural light. But if that's not a possibility for you, Turn on as many lights as possible. You can even go to Home Depot or Lowe's and they have those little spotlights. The, uh, not spotlights, but they're work lamps. And I want to say they cost is it $5, ten, maybe $10 for a little aluminum lamp. And you can just, you know, attach it to whatever, a workbench or just clamp it up high so that you can see. Because if you can see, you can easily take care of all those little drips and runs. <laughs> so the last reason that Uh, people get drips and runs is they might be using spray paint. Spray paint is infamous for drips and runs. To prevent these spray paint drips and runs, what I like to do is to keep the spray paint can at least eight inches away from whatever it is that you're spraying and keep it moving constantly. If you stop in one area when you're using spray paint, that's it. You're going to get runs because It's just too concentrated in one area. There's nothing for that paint to do but run. So if you are using spray paint, let's say you're spray painting some planters or something, even if you don't have a Lazy Susan, make sure that you are moving and and keeping that spray paint going. And you have to do several coats of light spray paint instead of one thick coat. So let it dry in between and then do let's say two coats of spray paint. All right, so let's say that you follow all these precautions, but you still have a few paint runs. Well, if the runs are still wet and you're using furniture paint, you can use your brush to smooth it out. And if you've got some runs with spray paint, here's what I do. I take a small rag and I try to gently blot those runs with a lint-free rag. Now it has to be lint-free because if you're using anything that has lint, you're gonna see it in your paint. So I, I like to go to like Home Depot. Actually, I saw them at Sherwin-Williams the other day. There's this, they call it a a bag of rags or roll of rags. That's what it is. Roll of rags. And it's like $10. And they've got that t-shirt material in there, lint-free. And I'll use that to gently just, you know, blot over that run and then do another light coat of spray paint over that blotted area. That should cover it up if you have any, any areas that need to be fixed with spray paint. Now, let's say your furniture, it's dried and you thought it was great. (laughs) And then you're like, oh, no, look at these runs. Okay, here's what you can do. You can take 220 grit sandpaper and you can try to uh, sand those out. This is easy to do if you use chalk paint. Most furniture paints, well, I don't want to say most furniture paints. If you're using like a chalked furniture paint, it's very easy to do because it sands very well. Now, if you're using like a regular wall latex paint, this is not as easy to sand. You can try it. It tends to get kind of gummy, but you can try it. (laughs) Anything's got to be better than, than leaving it. And then you can just go over it a little bit. And spray paint is a little harder to do too. That's why you really want to check your work before you're done. Because if you have those runs, it's so much easier to get it when it's wet. All right, so after you sand out any drips carefully, use your paintbrush to touch up the spot. And with spray paint, you're gonna just go over it very lightly. You can even do, once it dries, you can even do like a complete, you know, cover with spray paint and it'll blend in, it should blend in. But you don't wanna sand down too much because then you'll start to sand down to the original surface and it'll be more difficult and you'll be able to see the original surface coming through, okay? All right, so those are the things that you can do for mistake number one, which is the paint drips and runs. All right, mistake number two, brush strokes. Oh my gosh. Okay, brush strokes, they're not necessarily a bad thing. It just depends on the look that you're going for. Now, there are people who love shabby chic and they love the brush strokes because of the extra texture that it creates. But I'm someone who generally likes modern furniture. I don't really like to see brush strokes. But again, people who love the shabby chic look, brush strokes are a good thing (laughs) because if you're doing a clear wax followed by a dark wax, the cool thing is that the dark wax will settle into those grooves, into those those brush strokes, and it'll give it an aged look. So some people are going for that look. But me, I do not like brush strokes. (laughs) I like smooth surfaces. And if I've got major brush strokes, it's very frustrating. Okay, so here are the few reasons why you might be having brush strokes. So it might depend on the brand of paint that you're using. Okay, now there are some brands of paint, such as Beyond Paint. This is a paint that I've used in many of projects on my blog. 
They used to sponsor me. I have not worked with them in a long time, but I still recommend their paint because I do feel that if you're someone who has never painted furniture before, Beyond Paint, and I'll leave a link down below with my affiliate link, Beyond Paint does make it easy for people to just get started because they actually recommend that you use a small little, I believe it's a probably about a quarter inch roller. It's just a, like one of those small little mini rollers. They recommend that you use that. And when you use that, you won't see brush strokes. It will have a texture, but it won't be brush strokes. And so that's what they recommend. If you do use a paintbrush, you will see paint strokes or brush strokes in your paint if you're using Beyond Paint. So there are some paints that will make it more noticeable. And I think, you know, if you've never used a paint before, you always got to do a sample board before you do your real project. That way you can see how the paint handles. Does it spread easily? Is it too runny generally? Each paint has their own attributes and it just depends on the brand of paint. Another reason that you might be getting brush strokes is because the paint is too thick. Now, most paints will thicken up when it's left exposed to air. So let's say you're working on a project, the paint is spreading fine, it's not a small project, <laughs> and it's taken you a long time and you notice that the paint is starting to thicken up and now you're getting more brush strokes. So to correct this problem, most furniture paints will allow you to add a little bit of water and mix it. And that's fine. So as you're adding just a little bit of water and you're mixing it up, now it's going to have that same viscosity that it had when you first started. So that might be something that you can do. But again, remember, if you are someone who is like a shabby chic lover of, of furniture, you actually might want the paint to be thick because again, the thicker the paint, the more you're going to see the brush strokes and then you can do the dark wax <laughs> and get that age look. So that might be what you're, you're going for, but you really want to just read the paint's instructions and then check their website to make sure that their paint can be thin with water. Most times all these paints that are furniture paints, you can add water because it's water-based, right? Another reason why you might be getting the brush strokes is the type of brush that you're using. Now there's two, I'm going to say there's two types of brushes. You've got synthetic brushes. So those are the ones that have like nylon bristles and then you've got the natural bristles. Now the synthetic bristles, I love Purdy brushes. You used to be able to buy them at Home Depot. Now I think Purdy is just a Lowe's brand. And I think now Home Depot's brand is, is it Wooster? I want to say it's Wooster. And those are okay too. You know, I'll buy whatever they have there. But the nylon brushes, those ones tend to give a smoother finish. So if you're going for a look that's more modern, you want to use synthetic brushes if you want to try to get rid of those brush strokes. Now, if you're someone who loves just using that bristled brush to get that textured finish, again, you might like that shabby chic look, then that's what you want to use is the natural bristled brushes. And if you go to the Home Depot or Lowe's, they actually have the china brushes. They call them chip brushes, but they also go by china brushes. And they're super cheap. Like for one brush, it's maybe... A dollar twenty five, and if you order from Amazon, you can get a whole rack of them for like ten bucks. <laughs> so those ones are really good if you want to see the texture. You want to use the like the hog hair texture. So that's you know that's kind of what you're going to get with both of those. Now you might even use a paint sprayer. That's going to completely get rid of any brush stroke. You just have to practice on maybe a piece of wood before you practice on your real project. But that is a way to get a nearly flawless finish. And I will leave a link down below to some of the paint sprayers that I've used that I do love. All right, so the last reason why you might be getting some brush strokes is because you haven't sanded yet. So when you're using chalk paint, first of all, I love chalk paint. The, the brand that you may have heard of because it's worldwide is Annie Sloan. That's not the only one. I will leave a link down below to some other brands of furniture paint, but since I've started painting furniture, oh my gosh, the market has been exploding. I mean, you've got Rust-Oleum, they've got a chalked paint now. There's just so many of them. But what happens generally after you paint with a chalk paint, once it's dried, you want to sand it with a 220 grit sandpaper. Because what this does is it creates a nice, smooth texture. And you want to put two coats. Don't do one coat, do two coats because two coats is going to give you better coverage. Three coats would be like fantastic, but two coats generally. And once you sand it with 220 grit sandpaper, just very gently, you are going to see this 
gorgeous, like buttery, soft, smooth texture that comes out in your paint. <laughs> it's amazing. I painted this little stool for my mom, this little footstool. And I think I actually used the Rust-Oleum chalk paint. It was so smooth. Let me tell you, it was amazing. Like after I painted it, you could feel, you could actually feel with your hands, the brush strokes. And I used the synthetic brush, but even so, and even, you know, adding a little bit of water, it still gave me some brush strokes. But once I sanded that smooth, oh, it felt so good. I was like, man, I got to find me a desk and paint it with this chalk <laughs> because it felt that good. So use two coats. Be careful. Don't sand down all the way through the two layers. You're just doing a very light, smooth sanding. And then you're wiping that dust up. And once you feel it, it's going to feel like so amazing. Okay, so those are the first two mistakes. The third mistake is that you might have the old stain bleeding through the paint. Now, this isn't necessarily the old stain. This is what they call the tannins in the wood. And somebody emailed me about this the other day. I guess I must have been talking about it in a different blog post. And they're like, well, it's not the old stain. It's the tannins. And I'm like, yeah, okay, what's the tannins? But regardless, and she said all woods have tannins in them, which is, and God, don't get me lying. I don't even know how to explain it. But basically, it's like the chemical that's in the wood. And what happens is that sometimes when you're painting furniture, you'll have those tannins bleeding through the furniture paint. And it doesn't matter how many layers of furniture paint you put on it, it's going to bleed through and it'll start to turn it a different color. So you'll see it bleeding through. And in fact, I did a dresser years ago. It was this beautiful mid-century modern dresser and I wanted to do a white paint. Well, the tannins were just bleeding through. So it was turning like blotchy pink. So <laughs> at that time, I didn't know what to do to get rid of it. So I just painted the dresser like a light pink and problem solved. But what happens is that no matter how many layers, even if you just use like a, a primer over top of the paint to try to cover it up, the and I should, I, I should specify here the type of primer. Let's say you've got a primer that's in a can and you've done a couple layers of paint and you see the tannins bleeding through your paint. And then you say, oh, let me just put on a coat of primer. That generally doesn't work either. What I have found is that the only way to get rid of that is to do something called kills. And it's an oil-based spray primer. That is one of the ways that you can fix that. Like once you do a coat of that oil-based spray primer kills, it's, it, it creates this barrier upon which you can now paint. <laughs> So you have to do that, but it's very stinky. So you don't want to do it indoors, do it outside, wear a mask, have good ventilation. Another thing that actually works too, is if you notice that your furniture is bleeding through, you can actually do a coat of something called de-waxed shellac. It's also known as sanding sealer. And what that'll do is it, it pretty much en encases all the tannins and then you can paint over top of the shellac. So there's a couple ways that you can do this here. But what I found is that mahogany wood, oh gosh, <laughs> you should already know that you're going to have to do an oil-based spray primer first or the de-wax shellac. You're going to have to do one of those two things. <laughs> and I also noticed that if you're trying to paint it a light color, like a white or like a light yellow or, you know, like an off-white or something, that's when you see it more often. So if you're going over it with a dark blue, it doesn't bleed through. It's less noticeable. It's just when you're trying to do the light color. So keep that in mind. And then also too, if you're painting furniture, a lot of times people want to know, well, do you have to sand and prime first? Well, if you have that bleed through, then yes, you'd have to prime. Otherwise, I personally think you don't have to prime. Some people will do that prep each and every time. And if it works for them, great. But for me, for my own personal furniture, I don't prime first and I also don't sand either. I don't sand first. If you're selling a piece of furniture and you want this to last and you know it's going to be getting a lot of use, then, you know, I did tell the person who emailed me the other day, I said, okay, I'll be sure to include your notes. So she was telling me that she has been refinishing furniture for many of years. And what she finds is that people just want to get into the business real quick and get some furniture and slap on a couple coats and then sell it. She says, oh, that's always going to fail. It's always going to fail. And then people bring those pieces to me, who's a professional refinisher, and we have to fix the mistakes of everybody else. 
So, you know, I will say that if you are creating a piece of furniture that you plan to give to someone else that you're selling or giving to someone else, I would probably do a little bit more prep work to make sure that it doesn't chip or that it doesn't have problems with it. Sanding and priming? Mm, For me, no. But if I were to create a piece that I was trying to give to someone that I was selling and it had my name attached to it, I I may even sand it down to the bare wood first just to make sure. And would I do a primer? I don't know. If I'm using a furniture paint, I may not use a primer because with furniture paint, if you're putting two coats, the first coat is like a primer. I mean, part of it is marketing because, oh, you don't have to use a primer. But if you're putting two coats, it's like the first coat is a primer anyway. So, but again, if I were selling a piece, I'd probably put a a lot more effort. I probably would sand and prime just to make sure that it was going to be completely solid and wasn't going to chip. But, you know, for most pieces that I have painted, I don't feel that I have to sand and prime. But anyway, but if for mistake number three, if you are getting some of that, that old color or the, the tannins bleeding through, then definitely use the kills or the de-wax shellac and maybe try to go with a different color. If you don't want to prime it, then go with a different color where you're not going to see the bleed through. All right. So going on to mistake number four, chipped paint. <laughs> so like I have said, there are some people who love chipped paint. It's it's this shabby chic look and it's not my style, but some people like it. And I do think it takes some effort to make it look that way. But let's say you don't want it to look that way. What happened? What was the problem? Okay, well, there's a few reasons why this may have happened. Okay, so the paint might not have dried in between coats. So typically after painting your first coat, you should let it dry for about one or two hours before adding that second coat. And you typically want to look at the instructions on the back of the can to know how long the manufacturer recommends waiting. But I generally say one to two hours. It should definitely be dry to the touch and then go ahead and and paint it again. But if you try to paint another coat before it dries, then it can chip off. Sometimes it can lift off when you're trying to add that second coat. You might not have cleaned the furniture first. And I know this seems crazy, But I can tell you (laughs) that when I first started painting furniture years ago, before I even like did it and took pictures of it, I sometimes would just be so excited to get started. I would not even clean it. I would just start painting it. And I think when you do that, it's like putting makeup on a dirty face. Would you do that? (laughs) No, when you're putting makeup on your face, you're always starting with a fresh face. And I think furniture has to be the same way. So I would use simple green which is just a clean, a cleaning degreaser. It removes any surface dust and dirt and grease. But if you don't have simple green, you can also use vinegar and water that works as well. But make sure you are cleaning your furniture first. You might have used the wrong paint. Now, I think that personally, latex paint that you just generally go to the counter for at Home Depot and Lowe's, it's not the same as furniture paint. And while you can use it, I personally don't like to use it because I, I have just seen what happens down the road when you use regular wall latex paint. But if you're using that, that might be why you're getting some chips. That might be why you're getting some peeling. And I just don't tend to like it unless, unless I have to put this caveat in there, unless you're using something, and I believe I talked about this in a recent episode called BB... Oh, gosh, I can never pronounce this. BB Frosh, it might be Frosh, BB Frosh. And it's a paint additive. So it looks like a powder and you can add it to just a regular wall latex paint. You know, you probably want to go with a flat finish and that will actually create your own DIY chalk paint. That actually works pretty well, but just using regular wall latex paint on furniture, especially if you're trying to go with like a semi-gloss because you want it to be glossy, Mm, you're going to find that it's going to take a long time to even cure. And then even if it does cure, it's probably going to peel and chip. So I would stay clear of the latex wall paint unless you are using the BB Frosh and you're making your own DIY chalk paint. All right. So the other reason, well, the, the next reason why you might be getting some chips is that you might have used the wrong painter's tape. Paint that hasn't fully cured can easily chip off if you're using painter's tape 
on it. And this is if you're trying to, let's say, create certain styles or designs or whatever. Painter's tape is, that stuff, as soon as it goes onto a surface, it will pull up whatever's on it if it's not completely cured. So frog tape actually makes a sensitive surface tape, which is amazing. It's actually yellow and it's made for surfaces that were just painted. And this works, of course, for the walls. That's why it was created, but you can use it on furniture too. Let's say you're trying to do like a little simple design, or maybe you want to do stripes or something like that. Definitely use the sensitive surface tape because that may help just prevent any chips from coming off from your paint. Okay, so the paint might not have fully cured yet. And I think furniture paint is very hardy, but you still have to let it cure before you start using your furniture. Because if you start using it before it's fully cured, which could be about a couple weeks, you might notice chips in the paint. You just want to let it cure for about two weeks. And if you're using a top coat, you can let that dry as well. And that, you know, of course, takes time to fully cure. And if you're using this furniture for, let's say, a dining room table, you definitely want to let this cure because you'll start noticing marks on that table if you start using it too soon. Another reason why you might be noticing some chips is that maybe a top coat or a wax wasn't used. Now, not every brand of paint requires a top coat. There are some brands like Beyond Paint and another brand that I really, really like is called Mineral Fusion. They actually have top coats built into them. That's nice because once you're done with your two coats, that's it. You know, you don't have to add a top coat. Now they do make top coats. If you're creating a piece of furniture that's going to get a lot of traffic, a lot of use, then I would say go ahead and add those extra top coats on. But if it's just like a bookshelf that you're not pulling things off and on, it's just really there for display. Nobody's really messing with it. You don't have to do a top coat if you're using those two brands of paint. Now, other paints like Annie Sloan, those usually require a wax on top. You can use a top coat, but generally people use a clear wax. And I would say that's for something that's light use. So now I wouldn't use wax on a dining room table. You would need something that's going to be a little bit more hardy to protect that paint, that coat. And again, if you're using it for something heavy duty, like kitchen cabinets, tabletops, you definitely want to have a few layers of a top coat. And the one that I really like is General Finishes. It's called High Performance Water Base. I will leave a link down below for that. But I really, really like that one. With any top coat that you're adding to the paint, always do a test board first. Do your finish on a board, put the top coat, make sure that you like how it looks before you do your entire project. Just telling you as a tip, <laughs> ask me how I know. All right. So another thing that I would say is a reason why you're getting some chip paint is because maybe you didn't sand or prime. Now, as I mentioned, most furniture paints don't require you to sand or prime, but some people do prefer to do a light sanding before painting. And if it's a super dark wood, priming can actually just help with coverage. Because let me tell you, with let's say you're painting a really dark piece of wood. It's super dark, right? You might have to do two, three, four coats just to get that good coverage. But if you primed it first, you might not even have to do that many coats, right? The primer may just help hide a majority of that dark color, and then you can do your two coats. So you might have to play around with it and see, depending on what it is that you're painting. And there are some paints that I think cover better. There's one that I really liked. It's called Salvage. Oh gosh, what is it called? Black Dog Salvage. <laughs> I think that's what it is. I have used them before and I feel that their paint is a nice thick coverage. And I find that sometimes I've painted things, I've only needed one coat. So it just depends on the paint that you're using. And sometimes you want to sand lightly. Sometimes you want to prime just because you've got a dark, dark color. So all of these chips happen for different reasons, but the method to fix it is really all the same, okay? First thing you wanna do is you want to sand smooth any rough edges around the chip with fine 220 grit sandpaper because when you're painting over this, you definitely don't wanna see those edges. And you can use a small craft paintbrush to cover the chipped paint area, but if it's a deep chip, that's kind of uneven with the rest, you might wanna use a little bit of wood filler. And usually with wood filler, you want to pack it in there just a little higher than the level of, let's say, the table that has the chip. And then once it dries, 
you're going to sand it smooth with the 220 grit sandpaper and then paint over it to blend that chip in. Now, you might actually have to paint the entire surface if the chip paint is kind of obvious, right? Because sometimes, you know how you just want to do a little touch up <laughs> and you go to touch it up, but then later, once it dries, you can see the touch up. Yeah, you don't want that to happen. So let's say you're doing a little table or something and it's chipped and you just fixed it, put a little bit of wood filler. You might want to just, you know, do a quick coat on that side to just blend it all in. All right, mistake number five. And the last one that we're going to cover in this episode is peeling paint. I kind of touched on this in the other mistake when I was talking about chipped paint, but one of the very first pieces of furniture, let me tell you about it, was this amazing green agenda desk. <laughs> Remember I just told you that I was working on my husband's office, his makeover? Well, this was the desk that I did for his office. And I was a novice furniture painter. And I thought that I could just, you know, run to Home Depot and pick up a quart of gorgeous green semi-gloss paint because I wanted it to be glossy. And voila, it would look amazing. Well, it looked great for at least a little bit of time. But guess what happened? It started to peel. This was a desk that my husband has used. Gosh, I think it's been seven years. It might have been seven years since I did this desk. You know, he sits there at this desk daily because he works from home. The parts where his arm rests on the table. So it wore away the green paint. It wore away the primer. It wore away the original finish on the desk. And it had bare wood right where his arms were. <laughs> Oh, and it started peeling. The paint was peeling. Even just last week, or let's say a week, week and a half ago, when I was finishing up his room and I was looking at the desk, the paint was still peeling. Like there was parts of it where I would just kind of lift the paint up and the, the paint is literally still peeling from seven years ago, right? So I would say the reason why this happened is because I used the wrong paint. And I, I don't care what anybody says. If you use regular wall latex paint, I just don't think it works as well as furniture paint because it just leaves that furniture feeling gummy. And I know that people like this shiny look of the furniture, but that's not the way to get it. I mean, the best way that I can say that you can get that glossy finish without having this problem is, and I haven't used it myself, but I've seen this product, I've seen it used uh, on projects, but Amy Howard sells a lacquer paint. It's a lacquer spray paint that just really makes furniture beautiful and shiny. And it's not gonna be gummy the way regular wall latex paint is. Over time, that gumminess doesn't go away. Like it still was peeling off seven years later. So I think if this happens to you, what you can do is you can try to strip it off. Like for example, with this desk, the only way for me to fix this is to strip the entire desk off and start again. So I think if you find that you're having this problem, you know, you might be able to lightly sand it with 220 grit sandpaper, but because it is so gummy, it's it, it's not going to sand very well. I would say if this is a piece that is starting to peel, but it's, it's not a piece that you use like a desk, maybe like just a side table or something that doesn't get a lot of cups and glasses and things, you might be able to just try to lightly sand it and then do some touch up. And again, you know, use those same instructions from touching up when you've got chips. But if this is a piece of furniture that you're using for a desk or a table, and it's just starting to peel all over, you're gonna have to just strip that. And if you need to strip furniture, I have instructions on how to do that. You can find the link down below. But yeah, so I would try to stay away from the semi-gloss paint. It just doesn't work very well. Okay, so another reason why you might have some peeling is, again, you might have skipped sanding and priming. <laughs> But I would say that if you do decide to use regular wall latex paint, let's say you're not using the semi-gloss, you're using flat, then I would definitely say you should be sanding and you should be priming to get good adhesion. If I'm using a furniture paint, those I generally can skip sanding and priming. But if you are using a regular wall latex paint, like just a flat paint, I would definitely say sand it and prime it and you'll be less likely to get peeling. And I kind of mentioned this before, but you might just be getting peeling because you're using this furniture in a high traffic area, like my husband's desk. Every day this was being used. If you're doing dining room chairs and you're painting them with a semi-gloss paint, well, 
the seat of the pants is going to be sliding off and on these chairs multiple times. And so that paint is probably going to start peeling off. So if you're using it for decorative benches or shelves that don't get a lot of use, those are less likely to peel and chip because no one's touching them. No one's disturbing the paint. If you are using it for a high traffic area, then I think it's going to require more prep and it's definitely going to require maybe a different paint, something that's made specifically for furniture and not just the regular wall paint from, you know, Home Depot or, or Lowe's. All right. So those are the five mistakes that you might be running into. And hopefully I've given you some good information on how to fix those things and how to prevent them. Again, mistake number one, paint drips and runs. Number two, brush strokes. <laughs> number three, the tannins or the old stain bleeding through. Or mistake number four, chipped paint. Or mistake number five, peeling paint. And I've had all of these things happen to me. So next week, we're going to be covering mistake six, which is your white paint is turning yellow. We'll cover mistake number seven. <laughs> you might have missed some spots. Number eight is your paint looks spotty and you have poor coverage. Mistake number nine, your wet paint is getting dirty. And mistake number 10, choosing the wrong color. So you have to come back next week for episode 42 because we're going to talk about all those mistakes. What I want to know from you is, do you have these mistakes happen to you when you're painting furniture? Which one is the most frustrating? And do you have any solutions yourself? Like you might have some solutions that you have come up with to help with these problems, to prevent them or to fix them. I want to know. I want to know if you've been running into these problems too. I will leave the blog post for this down below if you want to revisit this or maybe just have this, you know, as a handy little guide. It's not a PDF or anything, but it's the blog post. So you can see the blog post down below, but you got to come back next week because we're going to talk about more painting mistakes and how to prevent them and fix them. All right, guys, I hope you have a wonderful weekend and... Thanksgiving's coming up soon. I hope you're making plans for friends and family coming over. And also, we are still doing the 90 Days to Neat Challenge over in the Facebook group. I'll leave a link down below if you want to jump in. This is technically day number 12. And I've been like crushing it <laughs> every day after I come home from my run. And I'm like, all right, I got to get a shower. I got to do my one hour of 90 days to neat. Got to do it. And it's the first thing that I do once I'm ready to start my day. Like I have to get it in because I'm trying to stay consistent. And I hope that you are staying consistent by giving it one hour every day to declutter your house and really just keep the things in your house that you love and get rid of the things that you're not using anymore. Right. Also, don't forget, I have a power tools course that is coming. I've been trying to get this together while doing all the electrical stuff in my shed. <laughs> I like really need to clone myself. I really feel like I do because I, I don't have a lot of time. Anyway, we have a power tools course and you can find the link down below to sign up to get more information. That's going to be releasing very, very soon. So if you're looking for a holiday gift for your friends, for your family, for yourself, the course is going to be opening in the next couple of weeks, and I'm actually going to be having it for less than what it's going to cost when it launches in January. So if you want to be one of the first people to get this lower price, then you have to click down below and sign up for that list because as soon as this course opens to pre-purchase, you are going to be the first ones to get it at a at the most affordable price, right? If you've been wanting to learn to use power tools or you want to give the gift of learning power tools, this course is going to be able to help you do that. All right, guys, I will see you next week for episode 42. I'll see you next week, next episode.